Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture. Now that we know a bit about trees, we will take a look at applications of trees. So I will present three applications for you. And then after that, we have a guest lecturer who is a biologist and who will tell us about how graphs and trees can be used in biology and how she uses them in her current research. But let's start with some other applications. So the first application of trees that we'll look at is the so-called minimum connector problem. The idea is that you have a number of places, for example, a number of cities, and you want to build a network connecting these cities, for example, a railway uh, network. And as usual, we depict the cities as vertices in a graph, and we have weighted edges between them uh, that represent maybe the length, the distance, or uh, the cost of building a railroad. So these two cities are cheaper to connect than these two other cities. And so the idea is that, of course, you can build all these uh, railroads that I have drawn in the graph, but that's unnecessary. That costs too much. If you just build enough edges so that all trees are connected, then everyone can still get to every other vertex, maybe changing a train once or twice. So the uh, application, as I said, is, for example, railroad uh, connecting cities. And the mathematical model is that in such a weighted graph, we want to find a spanning tree of the smallest total weight. Why spanning tree? Well, remember, we want a graph that is connected and has no superfluous edges, so that if we remove any edge, the graph will be disconnected. That's exactly one of the characterizations of a tree. And of course, we want smallest total weight, so we want to include edges in such a way that the sum of all the weights included is as little, as small as possible. So we want to create a spanning tree of the minimal total weight that we will call the weight of t or w of t. And the way to do it, one way to do it, is to use the greedy algorithm. So the greedy algorithm is an inductive method to create such a spanning tree for a weighted graph g on n vertices. Now, often, uh, what the graphs we are looking at will be complete, uh, meaning that theoretically we are able to build a railroad between any two cities we consider. But uh, this algorithm works for any uh, connected uh, gra graph G on N vertices. So let's look at this graph and let's see how the method goes. So you start with any edge of minimal weight. So uh, you have this diagonal edge and this edge here that both have weight 2. And we choose one of them. So let's maybe choose this edge. This is the edge to include. And it seems fairly intuitive that uh, you include the cheapest edge, so to speak. And then at each step, at step number i, now you have a bunch of edges that you already chosen. And you add an edge of the smallest weight available without creating a cycle. So now that we have chosen this edge, now we look at the other edges. Which edge has the smallest weight? Well, it's this other edge has weight 2. And if I add it, I don't create a cycle. So I add it. And then I repeat uh, which edge uh, has smallest possible weight, where I have 2. I have this bottom edge that has weight 3 and this top edge that has weight 3. But if I include the bottom edge, I would get a cycle, which is not OK. So then I include the top edge. In case both edges of weight 3 had created cycles, I would have gone on to edges of higher weight. But now, luckily, we uh, could include this. And now I have, since my graph has four vertices, now I have created a subgraph that is connected and has uh, three edges. and. Uh, in that uh, case, I will stop. So I created this spanning tree. It will, by the way, automatically be connected because it is a graph of n minus 1 edges. 
uh, and n vertices. So and it's it's a uh, uh, and it doesn't have cycles. So therefore, it is a tree and it is connected. And then I stop. So this algorithm works in general. Why does it work? Well, it works in the sense that I can always continue it one step further, meaning I can always add edges until I have my spanning tree, uh, meaning that I can always add edges so long as I have less than n minus 1 edges. Why is that? Well, from a theorem from before, we know that a connected graph has at least n minus 1 edges, if n is the number of vertices. So as long as I have fewer edges than that, I have multiple components. And as we have seen before, drawing an edge between two different components of a disconnected graph does not create cycles. So I can continue this until I have n minus 1 edges. So I can continue the algorithm all the way. But why does it give me a spanning tree? Well, it gives me a, a spanning tree because, again, I'm adding n minus 1 edges to n vertices and not creating cycles. Such a graph is automatically a tree, and since it includes all the vertices of my original graph, it is a spanning tree. The most non-trivial part to show is why this tree has the uh, lowest possible weight. It is kind of intuitive because if you look at the algorithm, at each step I am adding an edge of the smallest possible weight without creating a cycle. So it's not hard to believe that this actually works to give me a tree with as little weight as possible, but let's go through this thoroughly. So why is t of minimal weight? Well, assume it's not. Assume I have a different tree, s, that has smaller weight. And let's see how this leads us to a contradiction. So if that were the case, and since uh, w of s is strictly smaller than w of t, this means that s is a different tree. So at some point when I created t, I added an edge ei that is not in s. So look at the first time this happened, the first edge ei that I added that was not in my tree s. If I add ei to the tree s, I would create a cycle because, remember, a tree is such that if you add any edge, you create a cycle. So now you have a cycle containing this edge ei and an edge from s itself. But then the weight of ei is smaller than or equal to the weight of the edge from s. Think about what this means and why this is the case, and I'll tell you in a moment why. Pause and think. So the reason is that by construction, at each step, I am adding the edge of smallest weight. So if the edge e that I did not add when I constructed t had had smaller weight than the edge I actually added, then I would be violating my algorithm because I could have added both edges without creating a cycle because I had multiple components. So that's why I know that since I have followed my algorithm, the weight of ei is not bigger than the weight of e. So now I do the following. In this tree s that supposedly has smaller total weight, I remove the edge e and I add the edge ei. I replace the edge e with ei. So now I get another spanning tree. This uh, was an exercise in the assignment. Uh, another spanning tree with one more edge in common with t because I exchange an edge that was not in t with an edge that was in t. So I get a tree with uh, less than or equal to uh, the weight of s and one edge in common with t, more than I had from the beginning. But then I can continue this replacement, and in the end, by replacing each edge that's not in t with an edge that is in t, I will get my tree t. But at each step, I am reducing or keeping the weight. So in the end, this will imply that w of t is smaller than or equal to w of s. Why? Because at each step, the weight does not increase. But I assumed that s existed with the property that it had smaller weight than wt, and now I'm saying that s has greater than or equal to the weight of wt, so that's a contradiction. So the greedy algorithm does provide a tree of the smallest possible weight. 
So in short, for the greedy algorithm, at each step, I add an inch of the smallest possible weight that doesn't create a cycle. There might be several options, and therefore there might be several trees uh, that have the smallest possible weight. Uh, the greedy algorithm doesn't say that I get a unique tree, but if there are multiple ones of the smallest possible way, then any of them is as good as any other, so I'll get one of these trees. This is an algorithm that is uh, useful in itself, but also you can apply this application to another previous application we had in this course, namely the traveling salesman problem. So the traveling salesman problem is the problem where, remember, you had a graph, maybe a complete graph, and you want to find a Hamilton cycle with the lowest possible weight. So not a spanning tree, but a Hamilton cycle. A priori, this doesn't have anything to do with spanning tree, but there is a way not to solve the traveling salesman problem using the greedy algorithm, but to get a lower bound on how cheap you can get away with your Hamilton cycle in G. Let's see how this works. So suppose I have found a Hamilton cycle in my graph G. If I remove a vertex from G, I will get a Hamilton path for the remaining graph. And so the weight of my cycle will be the weight of this path plus the weight of the two vertices connecting my, uh, the two edges connecting my missing vertex to uh, this path. So let's see how this works in this example. So suppose I actually remove this vertex V. And maybe my Hamilton cycle was going around the graph like that. But in that case, if I then I get a Hamilton path from U to X, X to Y. And when I put back V, I just connect the endpoints of this path to V and then I am done. So if I had a Hamilton cycle, then this Hamilton cycle will induce a Hamilton path on the graph where I remove the vertex. This Hamilton path, because it's a path through all vertices, doesn't have cycles, it is a spanning tree of the remaining graph. So when I remove the vertex and I look at my smaller graph, this Hamilton path, which is a special case of a spanning tree, will certainly have at least as much weight as my optimal spanning tree, the spanning tree with the least weight. So the weight of the total Hamilton cycle would be at least the smallest possible weight of a spanning tree when I have removed the vertex, plus the smallest possible weight of two edges connecting these uh, two components, the vertex to the graph minus the vertex. So let's see how this works here. So if this is my G, then G minus V will be this graph u, x, y with uh, weights 3, 5, and 2. So an optimal spanning tree, here I don't really need the algorithm, it's obvious uh, just by looking that choosing these edges is an optimal spanning tree. So this would be these edges. That's the spanning tree. And now I connect these in the cheapest possible way to my original V. So I have this one here and this four here. And in this case, I got a Hamilton cycle in the big graph, but that is not guaranteed. For suppose the weights were different, so suppose that this weight was in fact one and not six, then what would have happened is I would still have the same spanning tree for G minus V, but then when I connect V to this using the cheapest edges possible, I get something that is not at all a Hamilton cycle. 
So I do not claim that this creates a Hamilton cycle, but it creates some graph whose total weight is smaller than or equal to the weight of the optimal Hamilton cycle had I been able to create it. Why is this useful? Well, you might get a question, can I create a Hamilton cycle in this graph that's cheaper than 10? For, for less than 10 bucks, if these are costs in dollars for the edges, can I create a Hamilton cycle? Well, if you create this lower bound thing and you show that this is actually, uh, the cost of this subgraph is 12 bucks, then you know that the lower bound is 12 bucks. So for sure you cannot have a Hamilton cycle for a lower cost. So it helps you answer some question uh, and it helps you helps give you some information about uh, the solution of the traveling salesman problem, which exists, but which remember in general is very, very hard to find.